What up, what up, what up? It's Ibn Webb, Ibn Webb, Quran, and some here, another official thanks thing going down here. When I talk about just being blessed and having a lot of people in my life, you know, um, directly, indirectly, what have you here, this gentleman that I have coming on, Hafiz Farid, has been in my life, wow, for as long as I can remember, you know, just seeing his journey, you know, as far as things that he has accomplished or what have you here, probably one of his most important roles being a father, outside of being a father here, great filmmaker, writer, and artist, and actually he has something on the horizon that's coming, looking forward to, to viewing this as well too, uh, a film about Maya Angelou, Reflections of a Blessed Soul, so I'm looking forward to, to viewing that as well too, but like I said, I, I've been blessed, he's definitely an extension of my father, you know, so um, to get him on, just to hear, you know, him talk, you know, I'm just going to sit back, you know how I go. I just like to, to sit back and get all the jewels that I can get and continue to get here, even in this day and age here. So just hold tight. There we go. There we go. Assalamualaikum. All right. What's going on, brother? Good, good. Nah. Thank you. Thank you um, once again for just um, for doing this here, because I know you didn't have to, you know, Wall. So I, I really, I really appreciate it here. So uh, just taking time out and, you know, Wall. Um, busy gentlemen such as yourself here i just want to actually jump right into what you have going on here in regards to um upcoming film if you're willing to talk about it the whole uh my angelo reflections of a blessed soul if you don't mind just diving right into it okay okay first of all let me thank you brother for um for inviting me on and uh it's always, it's always an honor and a privilege to share um, you know share a little bit that you do know and that you learn over the years to uh to those who want to listen and those who have mm -hmm. ears um so i appreciate the opportunity mm -hmm. i um starting off with with uh my film career uh i'm a filmmaker mm -hmm. uh, an artist writer and activist and um i think it's important to to state that because uh being a filmmaker today um, many people might construe that you're just trying to be part of a, a Hollywood black pack, so to speak. You mm -hmm. know? And that's never, that's never been my intention. It's always been my intention to be in the tradition of many of the great uh, African-American filmmakers and African filmmakers that most of us have, have not really heard of much. And people like Haley Jarima and um, <clears throat> uh, Bill Graves and uh, uh, the recent uh, award-winning film by Raoul Peck called I Am Not Your Negro, which is a documentary on, mm -hmm. on James Baldwin. These are many of the vanguard filmmakers uh, that um, uh, have produced powerful, powerful films that elevate and teach uh, about our history and our culture. But these are not individuals that, you know, that, that Hollywood has embraced. You know, yeah. they're, you know, the content of their uh, their art is uh, it goes right in the opposite direction than uh, than what Hollywood really wants. You know, it's very important uh, to control the images of a people if you mm -hmm. want to control those people, and um, and so we're not really still still not really in control of our images. And these filmmakers I just mentioned <clears throat> have always taken the independent route. Uh, raise their own money, and uh, uh, films like Daughters of the Dust, films like The Maroons, films like the, the film I mentioned, I Am Not Your Negro, um, are films that we must, you know, we must go back and look at and, and recognize these great artists. So I've always wanted to be in that kind of tradition. <clears throat> and Maya, you mentioned Maya Angelou, and we were blessed to interview Maya at her home uh, before she passed away. A couple of years before she actually made her transition, and it was a, a, a beautiful and transformative experience to meet this great woman, this great mind, and this great artist and actor. Yeah. Um, I have been trying to to interview Maya for a number of years, over over five years. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to use, uh, uh, utilize her voice and her thoughts. Uh, and her point of view in projects that I were doing. And we happen to be doing a project called Presumption of Guilt, 
Race, Class, and Crime in America, which was a film based on uh, a book by a Harvard professor by the name of uh, Professor Ogletree, mm -hmm. uh, Charles Ogletree from Harvard. Uh, he wrote this book after the incident where uh, Henry Louis Gates, remember the incident where Henry Louis Gates was arrested? Yes. Uh, on the porch of his own home in Cambridge, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, even after he had uh, uh, provided information and ID that he was a Harvard professor, the policeman still still arrested him. Uh, so uh, Professor Ogletree was his attorney on that case, and that case became a very uh, well-known, celebrated case and resulted in a beer summit called by the president, if you remember. President Barack Obama thought that the best way to deal with that that incident was like it was an isolated incident, uh, uh, and let's have a beer summit. Let's talk it over a few beers. That was, you know, to to the uh, chagrin of a lot of people. A lot of people didn't like that because they thought that that issue should have been brought up and used as a teachable moment. Even Henry Louis Gates himself said he's going to make a documentary about the intersection between race, class, and crime. And then uh, Professor Ogletree subsequently wrote a book called Ray, uh, Presumption of Guilt. Rather than a presumption of innocence, he wrote a book called The Presumption of Guilt, Race, Class, and Crime in America, um, pointing out how the intersection of race, class, and crime was evident in this particular situation, a blue collar white police officer from, from Boston and um, a professor of, uh, African-American professor at Harvard. And so these were two different classes. Now the African-American is on more of a, 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 a upper class and the and the blue collar white police officer is you know it's kind of on a, on a lower caste uh, or class system and those intersections between race class and crime are all evident in that situation so I, we were doing the film based on the book mm -hmm. professor ogletree gave me permission to do a documentary uh in which we did and it became an award-winning documentary and I wanted Maya Angelou uh, in it. I wanted to interview her and have her voice and her point of view. And uh, finally, she uh, agreed to have us interview her and invited her us down to her home in North Carolina. <clears throat> and we went down and interviewed her. And while we were down there, the interview, we, we spent a substantial amount of time with her and got a lot of footage. And after we got that footage, it was so priceless so valuable yeah, yeah. i came up with the idea to say well we can't just take edit and use a piece of this for the one film that we were doing let's go ahead and uh compile this and look at it and and uh, and do a film you know on her reflections because that she was in about 83 years old her mind was as sharp as you know as a tack she was very clear and and uh, just had all this this wisdom and experiences in her, and she shared it with us. And so, like you said about thanking me for being on here, Maya said one time, uh, one of the greatest lessons that she learned from her grandmother was, uh, once you learn it, teach it. Mm -hmm. Once you have it, share it. Mm -hmm. you know, so I come in that tradition, you know, um, you know, things that I've learned, uh, I wanna share it now. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity. So that film became a film called Reflections of a Blessed Soul because it was Maya's reflections. And she certainly is a blessed soul, a very unique uh, woman um, whose history uh, and, and the people that she's interacted with uh, uh, stem from everybody from Langston Hughes to Duke Ellington, yeah, yeah. To Max Roach to Miles Davis to Abby Lincoln to Martin Luther King to Malcolm X. She was like an axis between the both of them. She was very close with, with Malcolm X and she was very close with, with uh, Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. two people who had you know philosophies that were somewhat different in terms of their method of approaching the, the Negro dilemma, if you will and one separatist and one you know, integrationist. And yet she, uh, she was a nexus between both of them and was beloved and respected and admired by both of them and she mm. had the same kind of respect for them. So a very unique, unique individual. And, um, uh, and I just 
thought that it was a, the right thing to do to take what we had and what she shared with us and put it and frame it as kind of a portrait of her. Uh, and we didn't do it in the typical, even though I interviewed her directly, mm -hmm. uh, I made the decision as a director to take myself out of the, the frames, you know, the film and just focus on Maya, you know, and when you see the film, it's really uh, uh, about Maya and her, uh, her expressions and emptying her, her soul and sharing a wisdom and a spirit with us. Do you have a, do you have a time frame as far as it being released? Well, we, the film has been uh, screened throughout the, uh, throughout the country and has won uh, five different awards. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, the last award it won was Best Documentary in the New Jersey uh, International Film Festival. It won uh, an award in the Martha's Vineyard Film Festival uh, and several other, other awards. So we've been screening it for the public. Now we're actually getting ready to, uh, to market it and to put it on uh, a, a streaming platform so mm -hmm. that people can buy it. You know, we had, we had to, uh, to go through some legal uh, licensing agreements before we could actually put it out there. So we screened it for the public, but not, we didn't sell it until we uh, had got all the legal uh, licensing approved we because we used some music by the great jazz artist Bill Evans who was uh, one of Miles Davis's famous uh, uh, favorite piano player and, and we use a, a beautiful piece of music called Peace Peace and we didn't want to part with that so sometimes yeah. as a filmmaker you use classic music you know that just fits so perfectly with um, with your uh, your story Mm -hmm. and your images and you don't want to part with that but what you what you do by doing that if you use nina simone if you use billy holiday if you use marvin you know um then the licensing becomes something that a hurdle that you have to you know you have to overcome and you have to get that that clear before you can actually go out and sell it but um but we were able to get that and uh, just a couple of photos that we are licensing right now and we're looking um, uh, at the month of July to okay. have this ready to be released. No, uh, that's great. And it's interesting you mentioned uh, Martin and uh, Malcolm here. One of your other pieces, I'm not sure if uh, I remember discussing with you probably a few years ago that you was going to put together about them two. And I remember you just sharing with me, like you know, you know they show pictures of, of, of two of them together. But mm -hmm. however, they never like really sat and talked. It's always. I remember you just sharing, like, they just seen each other in passing, you know, and I know the media kind of makes these pictures like they really had these long sit-downs or what happened. It was uh, peach, Peaches, it was, so, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Mm -hmm. I remember you just sharing that with me some time ago that you was thinking about putting something together about that. Do you, you recall that? Yeah, we have. And that, that's a project that I've been working on for a number of years. And mm -hmm. We've copyrighted it, so it's protected. And mm -hmm. even even now to speak, I'm, 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 I'll speak on it uh, uh, lightly. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll speak, I'll, I'll give you just kind of a, an idea, but won't go into detail because we're in, in uh, pre-production for it now. But mm -hmm. it is important um, to, uh, uh, when you have access on a platform like this, to put it out there so that even you actually establish a record. This is just a little tidbit for, for writers, aspiring screenwriters, and uh, uh, not only copyright your work uh, to protect it legally, and not only go to uh, Screenwriters Guild, uh, mm -hmm. these are forms of protecting your content and your intellectual property that you created, but publicize it. Publicize that this is your, this is your project, this is your work. And this is a project that is dear, near and dear to my heart for many years. I'm a student of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. She's, you know, one of my primary mentors, along with many of the other great, great minds that, you know, that we've been blessed with. But um, I had a, a, a very personal relationship with that particular movement, you know, as you know, that, that experience. And uh, so I have the utmost respect and admiration for him. And, um, and he's often overlooked 
you know, this giant of a man who's basically, you know, it can be, I don't even think we, most people would not even argue that no one has uh, had the kind of success in reforming drug addicts, you know, uh, ex-felons, convicts, mm -hmm. prostitutes, you know, and cleaning up alcoholics. No one has could even come near the success that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had with, um, with achieving these kind of, you know, reforms and rehabilitations and also elevating, you know, elevating uh, African Americans from a person like Malcolm X, who nobody was checking for Malcolm when he was a, uh, uh, a small time uh, criminal, mm -hmm. convict in prison. No one was really, you know, and it was Elijah Muhammad who basically, uh, through Malcolm's brothers who were in the nation, introduced Malcolm to Elijah Muhammad. And through that connection and relationship that developed, you know, Malcolm X was uh, put on a world stage and became an international you know, spokesperson, mm -hmm. you know, first for the Nation of Islam and then, and then, and then a international leader of the um of the freedom movement mm -hmm. and um but we can never overlook uh elijah muhammad's role in that transformation of malcolm's life and many times we do and many times you know we mistake the movement and the program to have been malcolm's program <laughs> mm -hmm. and malcolm was just a part of elijah muhammad's program he said that till the day he died you know, that, you know, that was his teacher. That was the person that actually brought him into that, you know, to that awareness. And, uh, and so uh, I've always had in my mind <clears throat> a determination to give him his props, so to speak, to give the honor of Elijah Muhammad. I've seen too many, you know, uh, pictures and artwork that show all these different leaders. You've seen them, I'm sure, you know, they might show 10, 12 different leaders at a Last Supper type of depiction. And you see Garvey and you see Malcolm and you see uh, Whitney Young and you might see Baldwin and all deserving. But you see Elijah Muhammad left out many times, you know, overlooked many times, you know, and um, <clears throat> he was certainly not somebody that was insignificant, you know. Uh, uh, the, the men that were produced out of that particular movement, Malcolm, uh, Malcolm X being one, uh, uh, W.D. Muhammad being another, uh, Minister Farrakhan being another, Muhammad Ali being another. These are great men that were produced by this great man. You know, and of course, we know that there's a divine, you know, and God has a, uh, uh, the, the most important role in this kind of elevation, but working through the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he was the, the person that uh, kind of ignited the spark that, you know, lit the minds of these men up and who later went on to become some of the greatest men that we've seen in the last century. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as you, <clears throat> as you mentioned, there are, there are photos of Malcolm and Martin, but those photos, according to Malcolm's own word, they only met for a few minutes you know, at an event and um, uh, had, a, had a chance just to exchange a few words. There was never that kind of meeting where they sat right. down for hours and days, but there was a meeting between Elijah Muhammad and Martin Luther King. And that meeting took place at the home of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And that meeting was at the behest of Elijah Muhammad, who had been trying to reach out, attempting to form this kind of form a relationship with Martin Luther King all the way back to the 1950s. And we have documents to prove letters that he had sent to, them, to Martin Luther King, that Elijah Muhammad had sent to Martin Luther King, inviting him to come to Chicago and speak before his followers. Mm -hmm. That was the respect that Elijah Muhammad had for this young man who was still based in his 20s. Yes. You know, but uh, Elijah Muhammad was always a great man of vision. You know, he named Muhammad Ali Muhammad Ali, before he became the world heavyweight champion of the world, he gave him the name, which means praiseworthy and uh, the most high or the elevated one. And so he was a man of great vision. He saw 
the dedication, the courage, and the brilliance of Martin Luther King and wanted to meet with him and talk with him to form a united front. And that's mm -hmm. what you, when the letters are exposed as we do in, will in the film, you will see he was not asking Martin Luther King to get behind him and become a follower. He was saying, brother, we are working for the same goal, freedom, mm -hmm. justice, and equality for our people. And we need to form a united front, you know, which is a challenge that we are still faced with today. There's no one organization and no one leader that has all the answers to our dilemma, you know. And so many, many leaders throughout the years have been calling for a united front. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we have uh, missed that opportunity in many times. We had, you know, my time growing up, you had the Panthers over here, you had the Black nationalists, you had the Black Muslims, you had the communists, you had mm -hmm. the Marxists, and um, everybody kind of like, you know, working in their own, going in their own directions without forming a united front, you know, and uh, our enemy, our oppressors united, you know, racism, as Dr. Claude Anderson says, is a team sport. <laughs> you know, our yeah. oppressors, they operate as a team, mm -hmm. you know, against us. And as long mm -hmm. as we continue to operate as individuals and scattered like that, we will be, uh, we'll always miss the mark. So yeah, so that that project, you know, that meeting that took place 18 months approximately before Martin Luther King was killed, he met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, him and his wife, uh, Coretta Scott King, went to the home of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad after the invite, years after the invite. I really believe that many of the um, people that were in the inner circle of Martin Luther King, when Elijah Muhammad first reached out for him, didn't really want him. Yeah, that. I could see that. <laughs> because yeah. at that time, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been demonized to such an extent as a hate teacher. And mm -hmm. um, they didn't think that many, so many people who were close to Dr. King, probably thinking it wasn't politically correct for him to be sitting down with, you know, with, uh, with Elijah Muhammad. But at, at, at near the end of his life, Martin had evolved, which is one of the great things about Martin Luther King. He was an individual that was always growing, always evolving, mm -hmm. and wasn't afraid to accept, you know, a uh, new perspective and to evaluate himself, you know, and evaluate our situation. And uh, in that meeting, uh, you could just imagine if you were a fly on the wall, the kind of conversations and interactions. Yeah. That yeah. And that's what we're going to delve into. And uh, the piece is called Two Sons of Georgia. There we go. Oh, okay. <clears throat> because they're both uh, uh, sons of Georgia. You know? mm -hmm. Although we entitle we, we entitle it sons, uh, spell S-U-N rather than two sons, meaning they're not just natives of Georgia, but these are two of the uh, the brightest lights yeah. in our community. Mm -hmm. You know, um, illuminating lights in terms of their knowledge and their wisdom and their guidance and coming from one coming from the Black uh, Christian tradition and another coming from the Black Muslim tradition. And yet uh, they were the convergence and the confluence of their minds and their purpose uh, was one. They both wanted, you know, they both wanted the same thing, mm -hmm. freedom, justice, and equality for, you know, for their people and, 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 also, and also for humanity. Uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit of it, and uh, that's as I said, that's something that's very near and dear to me. And it needs to be needs to be talked about. It needs to be seen. It's a film that needs to be seen. Mm -hmm. No, I was definitely <laughs> here. I mean, this is just great. Just listening to all this. I have to ask though, as far as where all this thirst is for knowledge and this one information and, and the truth ultimately come from. I mean, being raised in Newark and. You know, obviously you could have took a lot of different detours here as far as, you know, where you're at today. Like where where do all all this come from? Like this thirst just again, just wanting to do this and mm -hmm. put product out that's, you know, makes sense. It's just not just to do it. Um where all where do, yeah. bottom line, where all this come from? Yeah, I think that um uh growing growing up, uh as opposed to now. In the in the age of the internet, in the age of Google and TikTok and Instagram, 
you know, um, I had the, the unique uh, experience of growing up in the age of books, mm. in the age of great men and great minds who were, who were uh, accessible right in our community. And, um, you know, I talk about Maya, who I blessed in my lifetime to meet, to sit with. Yes. She wasn't kind of as famous as she was, as wealthy as she was, both, you know, wealthy in terms of her, who she was and her, her richness of spirit and, and uh, uh, her soul, but she was, you know, financially, she had achieved great wealth in her lifetime, yet she didn't walk around with an entourage. She mm -hmm. was accessible. Mm -hmm. She was somebody that, you know, you could reach out and touch. Yeah. Uh, Muhammad Ali was the same way. There's nobody probably still to, that, to this day that was as popular worldwide as Muhammad Ali. There may never be another athlete, a, athlete activist that is as, as loved and internationally known as Muhammad Ali. You know, you're talking about a man that could go into the jungles of Africa and the Congo. Mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and little kids knew who he was, mm -hmm. you know, because he had put, you know, he had put humanity and he had put the people in front of um, uh, uh, the bag, so to speak, you know, yes. and, and, and in front of fame. And he had shown that early in his career, was ready to go to jail, was ready to die for what he believed in. And so how can you not, you'd have to be dead, man, mentally, you know, uh, uh, and deaf almost to not be affected growing up in that time. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, uh, it was an incredible time. This is the time some writers, some writers refer, refer to it as the new Negro. Mm. You know, not the Negro in, you know, chattel slavery, you know, which we all, all even in chattel slavery, we had some dynamic individuals like David Walker and Matt Turner and, you know, Denmark Vesey and Harriet Tubman. So you always had this revolutionary spirit fighting against oppression, but uh, segregation, Jim Crow, reconstruction, you know, uh, all kinds of efforts were made to terrorize, oppress, and suppress um, any rise of the Black mind and the Black culture. Come 1960, you have a new, new ball game. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, African Americans were tired, dissatisfied, angry and um have reached a point have reached a boiling point you know uh one 100 dissatisfaction brings about a change and the people were you know in many pockets in many parts of the country african americans were 100 dissatisfied so all it took was a um uh, a spark to set off uh rebellions mm -hmm. which happened you know uh in over 200 cities uh, so I'm a product of that. You know, I lived through that. Yeah. 1967 rebellion. This is yeah. war. You know, we look at, you know, we look at the television now and you see Ukraine and you see soldiers on street corners with M16s and AK-47s and tanks and, you know, but, you know, I saw this in my neighborhood. Mm. You know, saw it, heard it, you know, saw people getting shot and saw, you know, buildings being burnt down. It seemed like the whole uh, sky was on fire, you know, mm. for days and weeks at a time. And, you know, curfew is when they tell you that what time you have to go in. Mm -hmm. But in Newark, Detroit, Watts, Cleveland, you know, many other cities, they issue martial law. Martial law is when they tell you when you can come out. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so we had curfews and martial law during this time. And so, and as a re and, and simultaneously, you had these these very fearless warriors, you know, like you know Elijah Muhammad, like Muhammad Ali, standing up, you know, and saying, "I'm not going to war. I'm not going across the across the seas to fight some little brown man who ain't never called me nigger." Right, right. And I'm, my fight is right here with you. I can't even get decent housing. I can't get you know my rights. I can't get justice. I'm beaten over the head for no reason, police brutality, I'm killed, I'm lynched. So, you know, after a brother taking that stand, you're seeing that in 
you're seeing an athlete that's not only one of the most dynamic uh, athletic uh, examples in, in the world, but had a consciousness, had a mind, and had the courage to follow a, a leader that was bold enough to, uh, to talk about independence and do for self. And so all these things were influencing. You know, on top of that, uh, again, it wasn't a time of the gram. It wasn't a time of, you know, that people only read their phones. People right. actually read books. You know, people mm -hmm. had libraries in their house. Yes. You know, almost every African-American family had an encyclopedia, a set of encyclopedias. <laughs> yes. Britannica, mm -hmm. even, if you, even if it was secondhand, mm -hmm. you know. So you come out on the block in, 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 in an urban area, you come out on the block in the hood, in the ghetto, and even the wine heads and the dope fiends have books. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be a paperback, it might be Iceberg Slim, it might be, you know, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Man Child in the Promised Land by Claude Brown, and, you know, but people had books, people were reading, you know, and, uh, and you had to be able to, in order to join that cipher, so to speak, you know, you know, and later on, that cipher became brothers circling in a circle and rapping and you know, yes. um, competing, battling like that. But there was all there was a circle on on corners in in black communities where brothers would be rapping, but not for money and not for records. They would be sharing the wisdom and their points of view and debating. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to join that, to come out on the block and join. And to join those kind of circles, you have to have read something, mm -hmm. you know, or you couldn't really get in, be a part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. you know? All you could do was, you know, was, was listen if they would leave and let you stand there and listen. And so it was a, it was a very literate time. Okay, it was a very literate time, man, to grow up in. And if you had some kind of, and I, I credit my grandparents who raised me. And I even accredit some of the uh, African American teachers, and we all have had African American teachers in our our experience who may not have even been going along with the established curriculum, but they would make sure that they got in what they wanted to get in in terms of sharing right. sharing with African American young people, mm -hmm. you know, some lessons, some history, some books, some people, and those people unsung heroes. But they become very important, you know, uh, and you really can see it now because we're in a time now where uh, they call it this, this name, critical race theory, whichever, whatever that means, you know, but what right, it really right. is, it's, it's uh, you know, they know they're at a criminal, critical point in their lives, meaning all oppressors, and the browning of America has, you know, people enraged, you know, when they see people of color, brown, black people uh, growing and magnifying in population and uh, progress in America, this makes some white people very fearful and enraged. And so now there's a pushback now to even teach anything about African American history or African history in the school. And it's interesting, no, it's interesting you say that because yeah, you mentioned it legislative wise, some states have passed that that has to be taught. I mean, they just your, your traditional, you know, black history information is beyond that. Like they're supposed to go, you know, knee deep into, you know, black and actually Latino history as well too. So yeah. uh, it'd be interesting, how, you know, how um, to your point here, some of these curriculums adapt to that. And, you know, a lot of them, are, as we know, prehistoric, you know, like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them prehistoric. So yeah. it'd be interesting how that's gonna go moving New Jersey. Forward. New Jersey is one of those states. That's right. That's right. It has the Almastar bill. In fact, I went all the way down to Trenton to talk with uh, Congressman Bill Payne, who uh, introduced the legislation, you know, before it passed. Um, uh, but when I went down to the office, they had no budget. Oh, we got no money. We mm -hmm. got no money. No budget. No. He said there's a curriculum that was put together by a group of uh, historians, and the curriculum is there. But a lot of African American teachers are not um, are not delving into the curriculum and and um, and implementing it. You think it's a, you think it's a fair uh, the security of employment or 
What do you think the reason is? I think both. You know, I think both. You know, um, you know, John Henry Clark said one time, and you know, and to control the people, you must first control what they think about themselves uh, and how they regard their history and their culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and when your conqueror makes you ashamed of your history and your culture, uh, then he needs no prison walls. Yeah. Prison walls. Uh-huh. He needs no chains uh-huh. anymore. And so many of these African-American teachers have grown up. They've come out of segregation. They've come out of, you know, Jim Crow. They've come out of Brown versus Board of Education or post-civil rights movement. And so they're still products of the educational system that didn't have inherent in it African-American history. Uh-huh. You see what I'm saying? So it's a it's a learning curve for them to now go to now go back and start reading J. A. Rogers, uh, Ivan Van Sertum, John John Henry Clark, Amos Wilson, James Baldwin, mm-hmm. if they haven't been voracious readers. So they're products of this, of the American educational system that has hampered them. You know, and now they have to now relearn what they've learned. <clears throat> Mm. Which is one of the greatest challenges facing us today. You know, uh, that's the, the, the new illiterate today are not those that can't read, but those that refuse to unlearn what they've learned. Right, right. So, that, so that's certainly a part of it. People, people ashamed of their history and their culture. And, um, and then, then you teach them that it's time to embrace, you know, like Malcolm said one time when people, uh, he was respons- responding to people saying, uh, I ain't left nothing in Africa. I ain't African, you know. And Malcolm said, well, you left your mind in Africa, you know. But if you have that shame and disregard for your history and your culture, um, then it's very hard for you to grasp. Now I have to now relearn and reteach this history to, you know, another generation. So that's part of it. But now, as you say, even the fear of their employment, because just as certain states like New Jersey implemented the Amistad Bill, now you have red states racist conservative right-wing red states now are that have um legislated new law saying you can't teach this Mm -hmm. and and at the at the very core of it is i'm not i don't want you to teach young children black and white that we enslave them that we lynch them you know because that'll make uh these children you know aware and ashamed of what they, what their uh, parents and what their ancestors did. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you want to erase, whitewash, and erase any right. awareness or any knowledge of that. That's insidiousness, and what it's going to do to the white mind and to the black mind. You know, like Franz Fanon said, it's going to cause the, the black mind to grow up with black skin and white mind, and then it's going to cause the white mind who have no knowledge of what their ancestors did. <clears throat> grow up with a sense of, of entitlement and privilege and invisible white divinity. Because mm-hmm. at the same time, you're saying this can't be taught in the school, this history can't be taught, you know, that um, a, a little black girl had to be escorted into uh, her elementary school, a little six-year-old girl, you know, had to be escorted by, <clears throat> by law enforcement into the school in Arkansas, mm. in other places. And then when they got into that classroom, they found no other students because white parents took their children out of the school. Mm. And in one case, only one teacher from Boston um, uh, stayed in to teach this, 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 um, this, this black child, you know, because the other teachers refused to teach. This is the you know, this is just a a small fraction of, right, of the, right. the horrific history that that we've had to go through, and um, <clears throat> and so now you don't you're saying I don't want to teach that history to white to what to my white children because I don't want them to know that we did that to them. I don't want them to know that you know up until 1955 schools in this country were segregated and today still still segregated as segregated as they were before the passage of Brown versus Board of Education, you know, which said separate but equal. Mm-hmm. And you know, and um, 
And yet we have to, as African-Americans, have to take it upon ourselves. If that's the wave, if that's the direction that we see this country going in, what are we going to do? Right. What are we going to do in our churches, in our mass jigs, you know, in our black organizations and our fraternities? What are we going to do to combat you know, this onslaught of closing the door, you know, and closing the avenues that light can enter into the Negro mind? As one legislator said, you know, um, early in the development of this country, there's a quote by one of the uh, legislators that said, we have now closed every avenue by which light can enter the Negro's mind. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting you said, what can we do? I, 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 I will lean towards, uh, more than just lean towards it. I mean, what you've been doing for years, independently, just putting stuff out, putting this information out where you dictate <laughs> the material you want, you know, as far as what you... Right. Me. What we've been doing, because I've seen, you know, I've seen your podcast and I've seen other, you know, very bright minds on young brothers who are in the community and some of them in education, sometimes mm -hmm. they're in coaching. And so what we've done, and so, you know, as, as much as the, the, uh, the covers are trying to be pulled down over our people, uh, there's always brothers and sisters that are in people that are fighting against, you know, it's uh, uh, like Stokely Carmichael later, Kwame Torre said, progress, I mean, struggle is an eternal, it's a process, it's not an event, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not an event, man, it's, it, it's perennial, it's, it, it's eternal, the struggle goes on, you have to continue, because the, your oppressor is continually putting things in place to keep you down, but that's a real challenge for our mass jigs a real challenge for our black churches, a real challenge for black organizations and institutions, you know, mm -hmm. to do this, especially now that we know that they're legislating the, the very uh, uh, ending of any teaching of the, uh, of our history and our culture. So mm -hmm. we have to respond, mm -hmm. we have to respond. And, and along with the teaching attendance of religion, we gotta start teaching history. Yes. <laughs> you gotta start teaching history and culture, especially at a time when we're so uh we're so disconnected from our history. Mm -hmm. and I'm very, very concerned, you know, and it's one of the reasons that you asked me to come on and I started thinking about what's what some of the most important things that I could share. I have to go back to um to my elders, you know, and remind your listeners and remind ourselves of what was on Martin Luther King's mind, what was on Elijah Muhammad's mind, what was on John Henry Clark's mind, and Maya Angelou's mind, and James Ball before they made their transition. You know, because mm -hmm. we have a responsibility, we have to be accountable, and we have a responsibility to carry the torch. It's on us now. Yes, you know, it's on you, you know, it's on mm -hmm. me, you know, whatever I have left, I have to, you know, pass it on. <clears throat> so Martin Luther King, before he died, his last book was, where do we go from here? Community or chaos? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you think about that for a minute. Yeah. This is the last book he wrote. It was, uh, uh, I would highly recommend uh, reading of it took him years to write it but it was a very in-depth analysis of our situation our progress our history the civil rights movement the black power movement but now where do we go from here because he had reached a a, a, a higher level of understanding about our struggle in fact dr king said before he died according to harry belafonte one of his close confidants he said he saw martin that you know they were sitting down and Martin looked kind of sad and he asked him, he said, Martin, um, what's the matter? And he said, Martin said, uh, I think we integrated into a burning house. Mm. <clears throat> and other people in the room heard it, I guess other inner circle members of Martin Luther King circle. And everybody was kind of shocked because he seemed to be admitting that 
they, they had moved integration and this philosophy of integration too fast. And if you listen to the speeches, Martin Luther King's last speeches, when he went to Memphis before he died and what he was doing, working for the garbage workers, trying to get better pay for the garbage right, right. and better protection and better you know, insurance and things like that. He, and he started out speaking more about economics and the fact that we needed our own banks and we needed to control the economy in our community. And we needed to stop giving all these major events at hotels and conventions throughout the United States and spending millions of dollars with the same people that are oppressing us rather than to doing it for ourselves. So his language and his consciousness had begun to shift. And he said that to, to Harry Belafonte, that's a statement that he made. His wife, uh, Coretta Scott King, said uh, she found a letter in his pocket the, you know, when he was assassinated and it was notes from the speech that he was going to deliver the next Sunday, the lecture. And that speech was, uh, America may go to hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, um, uh, that was in, in accord with what Elijah Muhammad was saying, the fall of America. Mm -hmm. In accord with what, what James Baldwin was saying, fire next time. The destruction, you know, of the empire. Not physical destruction, but the destruction economically, socially, politically. Mm -hmm. Where we at now? Where the very, the very democracy in this country is in peril. Right. You know, we're almost at a second civil war, where you have, you know, whites fighting whites and attacking the, the capital and calling for the killing of the vice president you know, and the speaker of the house. You, you see, this is what was happening in in, in the civil war. Mm. States like South Carolina said they were going to succeed from the, from the republic. We'll be a sovereign state, South Carolina. You know. And many other states followed and resulted in white men killing white men mm -hmm. by the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And so this is where we're at again. It's very, very funny. Our history repeats itself. And so Martin said, where do we go from here? Elijah said uh, in, in an album, in a lecture that he did called uh, The Time and What Must Be Done. And James Baldwin's, one of his seminal books is a reference to a biblical uh, prophetic phrase about first time, the first destruction will be water, the next will be fire. And James Baldwin steeped in that, you know, that tradition of uh, uh, black theology uh, wrote the book, The Fire Next Time. Mm. We, we have these great minds among us who have been our leaders and our guides and our light, you know, all wondering what's gonna happen, community or chaos. And ask yourself, where are we at? Are we at community or are we at chaos right now? Nah, great question. Great question. And it's interesting you talk about the whole history repeating itself. And I just remember, again, just these conversations with, you know, people such as yourself and others here. And you mentioned, you know, Martin, the whole economic piece. I mean, has there been a shift in that in regards to, you know, um, those who make these the decision makers, how they're well off and you know, they went and got the, I guess, and I just, you know, blankly say they went and got the money first, then got the, then got the political seats with the power and everything else. And us as blacks or what have you always did that and did that in reverse. And it seems yeah. like we still, still, it's still that pattern. Yeah. And again, again, maybe I'm just like a, um, you know, a conduit for the elders and the wisdom of the elders, man, mm -hmm. to share with, with anyone who's listening, you gotta read this, man. You gotta read and study Claude Anderson, mm -hmm. economics, who talks about how uh, insane it is and ignorant it is to not try and control the, the dollar in your community, where every other ethnic group that we can think of, the dollar uh, circulates in their community nine times, 10 times, 12 times, the Chinese, the Asian community the Jewish community, the Hispanic community, the dollars circulate. 
mm-hmm. circulate. I rode in, in, I was in New Jersey a few days ago and I rode through um, Patterson and for about 20 miles on both sides of the street, all I saw was Muslim businesses mm-hmm. on Main Street in Patterson. Every business not you know sprinkling here there every business you saw they control they're controlling the economy of their community their dollar is circulating so the shoe repair shop the beauty salon mm-hmm. you know, the grocery store you know the halal meat place the furniture store the insurance company the law offices you know, the money is circulating yes you know, it's the same thing in the jewish community and the same thing in what they call chinatown they don't have chinese just moving out moving on up like the jeffersons and moving into the high rise and you know into the they they move as a group Mm -hmm. you know the indian community you ride down in wherever you live in whatever state in in new jersey is edison new jersey you know woodbridge and you know new brunswick and you see the same thing among the Indian community. Mm-hmm. You see the culture. You see they're still wearing their cultural clothing. You see they still are listening to their cultural music. Some of them even have movie theaters where they're showing nothing but their own movies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in Chinatown, you see Chinese movie theaters showing yeah. Chinese movies. Mm-hmm. You, go, <laughs> you go to Nigeria, you see they don't have Hollywood. They have, you know. Nollywood, you go to India and they have Bollywood and they show Indian movies, and, you, mm. know, you know, but you come into our community and it's just the opposite. Mm-hmm. Everybody else has a store, every, you know, the Italians, the, the Jews, the, uh, uh, the Irish, everybody else is in our community, the Chinese, you know, eating off us. Yes. And so mm-hmm. our dollar is not circulating even one time. Mm. We get it and it goes right out. Uh, speaking of eating off us, your thoughts on this past uh, Super Bowl performance? Yeah, that's that's sad. It's all related to um, the topic we're talking about. Where do we go from here? Mm-hmm. Community or chaos? Uh, I thought that was chaos. You know, the Super Bowl and sports in, in and of itself uh, is a way to keep people captivated, you know? So throughout a year, throughout 12 months of a year, you had major sport, sporting events uh, and seasons that keep you glued to your television, you know, uh, not just on a Sunday, but you know, Sunday, Monday night football, Thursday night football, you know, mm-hmm. Sunday again, you know, and then college, you got the Saturday games, you know, and then after the college season is over, you know, or the NFL season, you know, you have the uh, uh, the NBA season starts right before that one ends, and then the baseball season starts right. and then before that ends, you know, you have March Madness and then the whole month, 40 days and 40 nights. And, you know, that was an old biblical uh, 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 passage in the Bible that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Now it's raining March Madness. Now it's 40 40 games you know? mm-hmm. yeah and so you know we and i you know i'm a i'm a fan i'm a sports fan and it's mm-hmm. a great diversion especially if you're a serious thinker you need you need some diversions and you yes need, you know, and you know you're a former athlete and you know uh so there's a attraction uh, and appeal to uh to watch some of these incredible athletes man in the game itself and yet you still have to be aware that you're being programmed mm-hmm. and that you have to keep your eye on the prize, you know, and at the same time, we're watching and yelling and drinking and smoking and consuming, you know, beer and chips and chicken wings and pizza and all things. Massive amounts of money are being made by the owners, by the television stations, by the mm-hmm. merchandising, you know, and so, um, now you're right. Interesting. You said I'm thinking. I look at these uh, these contracts these these athletes are signing, but I'm like, I'm like, damn. Imagine what the owners is making. Exactly. Yeah. Two hundred million dollar contracts. Two hundred and fifty million dollar contracts. You know, 
Patrick Mahomes. It's ins- it's insane. And you know, you don't want to pay you don't want to pay a teacher. You don't want to pay a teacher fifty thousand know, dollars mm-hmm. or a police officer. So back to the Super Bowl, man. It's uh you know, I call it the stupor bowl because it has us in a stupor. And this just shows you how how asleep we are in this very serious time, you know, that uh, not just the game, but the halftime spectacle, which uh, for advertisers and businesses, they say is the most watched event um, uh, of the year. And so advertisers pay enormous amounts of money just for mm-hmm. 60 seconds, I mean, millions of dollars or a million dollars for 60 seconds, you know, to captivate your mind. And so the halftime spectacle is always a big thing. Who's going to perform? And they go get the biggest performance in the world and put them on stage. You know. And, you know, and many, this, this particular time, it was a modern day minstrel show this year, uh, in my opinion. And um, I'm very concerned uh, about where we're going. Where do we go from here, community or chaos? I'm very concerned about culture and our de- detachment from our history and our culture and a disdain and a shame of our history and culture. And then and because of that, we, we try and establish a subculture. Mm-hmm. Kendrick Lamar has a new song out. And in, in, in one of the lines of the song, he says, we kill each other, you know, and call it culture. Fuck that. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, you know, he's aware, Kendrick and the other brothers that, that are aware, and they're trying to put their message out there, but it's so much, it's not, a, it's not enough balance. It's not enough strong, positive, you know, artists like that compared to all the artists that are going the other way. So you have this spectacle, this modern day minstrel show, and you have artists actually wearing uh, the attire. Again, you know, culture is what you wear, what you eat, you know, how you dress, how you, music you listen to, you know, your behavior, your thought, that's your culture. It's the essence of who you are. And our culture is our salvation, as John Henry Revolution. Uh, and Krumah said, there can be no revolution unless there's cultural revolution. So until you change the culture, you ain't going nowhere. Revolution only means change. You're not, it's not gonna change. And so you have artists, some of the most iconic and most popular artists in the world, coming on stage and they're wearing the colors of gang colors and gang flags and doing the gang crip walk. Then you have beyond that when you shaking your head and say, well, can it get it? It can't get any worse. Man. I never then you have a group of brothers come out in prison guard and brown khaki prison guard dancing and mm-hmm. doing crip walk. You know, to the music of you know some of the biggest rap artists in the world, and you know I say minstrel show because we've always performed for the master on the plantation. Uh-huh. He always, he always wanted us after you know get your banjo. You know he wouldn't let us play play the drums because the drum he knew the drum we could communicate messages, and drum was a code language. So he could get your banjo and you know. Do your little cake walk, and you know, mm-hmm. and so we've always performed and had minstrel shows. And, you know, um, so that's nothing new. Uh, Can I ask <clears throat> to your point? I mean, you mentioned earlier. I mean, prior to, I mean, just talking about this, you mentioned, you know, um, need a diversion. I mean, what if? Again, I know minds are different throughout each individual here, but some might see it as, hey, this is their diversion, just some entertainment you know, somehow trying to put all of that in the good light, you know, the gang colors, the outfits, you know, somebody that might see it that way here. Again, I know different minds think differently here, but you got people that do think that. Certainly, certainly. And especially if you're, if again, if you're detached from your history and your culture, mm-hmm. if you're detached from, from the history that, of, um, that at one time, Gangs used to protect the community. There's always been gangs. Mm -hmm. So gangs used to protect the community. Used to protect the territory. And now gangs prey on the community. You know, so there's been a flip. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I mean? So, you know, so for an intelligent, mature mind, someone that's conscious, you know, um, certain aspects of uh, music, sports can be a healthy diversion, but mm -hmm. you can also have an unhealthy diversion, mm -hmm. especially if you have young minds who, when you start talking about a particular music in that genre, you know, who's listening to that? Not 80 year old African American, not 70 year old African American, for the most part, 60. You know, it's our youth. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't have the intellect to do what you said, to discern. Mm -hmm. Some of these, some, some of our youth are looking at this as validation and certification of prison culture and gang culture. And growing up saying, yo, I want to go to, I want to go to prison, man. You know, you went to college. Do you mm -hmm. know in the black community, there's young brothers who brag about, I went to, well, you grew up in New Jersey, so I'll name some of the reformatory. But wherever you grew up, whoever's listening, whatever state, you, you have these reformatories that are more well-known and, and young youth or young black youth are more familiar with the reformatories and the inst prison institutions than they are with the university. The youth house. So oh, right, right, right. Youth house, Annandale, Yardsville, mm -hmm. Bordentown, Trenton, Rawway, mm -hmm. Fed Joint. Mm -hmm. So you know, so just like you, just like you have a more intelligent uh, population, because this is not all our, this is not all black youth. Thank God, you know that we have a large percentage of our youth that are graduating, going on the higher education. I'm proud of that. You know, but just like you got some brothers who say, yeah, I went to Morehouse, I went to Spelman, I went to, you know, I went to Howard, I graduated from Howard. You got young brothers in the hood saying, yo, yeah, I went to, you know, I was down in the Fed joint for two years. You know? mm -hmm. And that's like a, you know, that's a feather in this cat. Oh, yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they come out on the block and the guy that just came home from Harvard and the guy that just came home from Trenton State Prison, he gets more props, you know, than the guy who came from Harvard. He just came on <laughs> and so you know it was the biggest promotion and advertising for gang culture that i've seen on national and international television mm -hmm. and i know from working with youth on a daily basis throughout most of my life that most of our young brothers can't discern and can't look at it and can't see that as a healthy diversion Mm -hmm. They see that as the certification and the, you know, and the uh, validation of, yeah, this is right, man. This is the gang culture because if, if Snoop is doing it, 50 is doing it, and they multi-millionaires, it's got to be. Because we, you know, the bag has replaced freedom. Freedom used to be the goal of, of our people. Now it's the bag. You know, and so uh, that prison culture, man, we make up over 50% of the prison culture in this country. We only, you know, 12 or 13% of the entire country. You know, maybe 60%, some, some uh, statistics say that 60% uh, of our households, there's no father in the household. So you don't have, you know, brothers like you and I and other brothers, that, you know, and fathers and grandfathers giving this different perspective. Right. That we can say, that we can sit down with our sons and grandsons and say, hey, look at that, man. What do you think of that? Do you know that what they got on is what they strip you naked and make you put on when you go to prison? That ain't something that, you know, you go out and buy that you really like to put, they make you put that on because they're breaking you down. That's part of the whole slave making and breaking process take your clothes off man. strip mm -hmm. bend over then they throw you, you know, this prison dog you know, and you got to put it on that's what you got to wear and that's the mark of oppression that's the mark of telling you know, you know state property mm -hmm. <laughs> you state property you wearing state property you eating state food you know and so when you put that on the world stage like that, with millions and millions of people watching, some people don't even see us, brother. There's some 
states right here in your and your state and my mm -hmm. state they don't see black people on a daily basis this right. is city. Right. This right. Is cities in New Jersey where they don't see black people. So the images are so important when they do see us. The light that we're put in you know, is so important. And again, you know, in order to conquer people, you have to now you, you have to make them ashamed of their own culture. And so a, a subculture develops out of the criminal culture, the dope culture, because that's what this is all, you know. The gang culture spreading from at one time was a parochial or a, um, a territorial kind of thing. When I was growing up, blood and crip culture was in the West Coast. It wasn't on the end coast, East Coast. It wasn't in New York. It wasn't in New Jersey. You know, back to your original question, I didn't grow up seeing, I grew up seeing Muslims and Black Panthers and Black nationalists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. didn't grow up seeing, I didn't grow up seeing, you know, OGs of a gang culture and you know. So yeah. so so these people, these revolutionaries, you know, I grew up in the same city that Amiri Baraka grew up with. You know, I knew Amiri. I could talk to Amiri on a regular basis. You know, and Amiri was bringing all kinds of other people in, like H. Rap Brown and Sun Ra and you know, um, you know, black jazz musicians, black cultural musicians, Nikki Giovanni, both, you know, and so <clears throat> I didn't have that burden of only seeing guys that was killing each other over mm -hmm. colors. Right. That was insane. And so it was a territorial thing, thank God, it hadn't migrated. But with the dope game, with the crack game, that took these subcultures, gang cultures, out of a regional area and spread throughout the country for the purpose of selling drugs, for the purpose of profiting, for the purpose of, you know, um, profiting and going after the bag at, mm. uh, at all costs, you know? And so uh, Freeway Ricky Ross, one of the notorious drug dealers who was sentenced to a hundred years or something, and got a book out now, maybe a movie coming out, admits he was given kilos and kilos upon kilos of drugs cocaine to sell in the black community by corrupt um, uh, agents of the government along with, you know, uh, uh, drug cartels mm -hmm. trying to raise money for the Nicaraguan war and Congress wouldn't put up that money. And he spells the whole thing out. Mm. This, was a con this was a concerted plan, pre-planned, premeditated. So we're being programmed and don't even know it, you know? And so uh, it's not, you know, where you, you think it's a diversion, but you're being commercialized and trivialized and nullified, you know, and broken down. And, and, and like John Henry Clark said, once you do that, you don't, you don't need to build prisons because the prison is the mind, you know? And so entertainment is one thing, art is another. There are certain people that don't consider themselves as an entertainer. They can consider themselves as an artist. Artists, yes. Begin this conversation. I said, I never want to just, I don't want to just be no entertaining filmmaker. I want to be a filmmaker and a writer in the tradition of these great, great uh, historic figures, African-American filmmakers, writers, and poets. That have come before. You know, you know, I, I want to be able to leave this earth saying that I tried to leave some kind of legacy that was right. in the tradition. That was in the tradition of my, my elders who, you know, who saved me, who taught me, who guided me, mm -hmm. to teach my son, my grandson. And so there's a difference. You know, Stevie Wonder's not just an entertainer, he's an artist. Mm -hmm. And look at his life, look at his contributions. You know, you know, Miles Davis is an artist. Duke Ellington uh, is just a, is an artist. They may entertain you, but you know, they have another agenda in, in their mind. You know, Oscar Brown Jr., Maya Angelou, you know, she's not just a poet. That's one of the reasons that we did the project. She's a philosopher. And when you go behind the scenes and see who Maya Angelou was connected with, and this is one of the reasons why as many, as much as people say they love her, and oh yeah, Maya Angelou, and quote her, 
she's one of the most banned authors in America. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Oh. She's one of the most banned authors in America. When you go behind the scenes, my Angelo's closest, you know, uh, associates and confidants in her life growing up was John Henry Clark, Lorraine Hansberry, mm. Max Roach, James Baldwin. <laughs> these, mm. these were some of the top revolutionary and so-called radical thinkers of their time. In our any given day during the period of our life and while living in New York, this was her circle of friends sitting up all night trying to solve the problems of the Negro dilemma. And some mm. of the most brilliant minds in the world. Mm. And so when you look at who influenced her and how she influenced them, and these are all people that are not embraced by mainstream America. John Henry Clark is not somebody that's held up as brilliant as he is right. as his historian. Right. And, you know, you know, um, neither is Baldwin. He, he achieved some notoriety and fame for a few years, but after they found out they couldn't buy him out, you know, he, he became, you know, persona non grata, so to speak. But this was Maya's circle. That's why she's the person that she is. And she never turned her back on these people and never, you know, never turned her back on her own people and her struggle. She was a warrior, an activist. You know, and she knew the hell that Nina Simone and Marion McKeeba and, you know, and, 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 and other, and Billie Holiday and all these people went through. You know, and sometimes the so-called entertainers of today have no idea because they're not tied to their history. You know, so they're not, so they're able to dance on these stages where just a few decades ago, they couldn't even, they, was, they had to go to the back door. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. they had to go to the back door of many places that she had to perform in. And she couldn't even stay in the hotel. She had to sleep in the bus. You know, this is, and I'm just mentioning one, but this is the legacy. You, know, you talk about sports and, you, and the Super Bowl. It was a, a, a time not just a few decades ago, where uh, a team came, an NFL team came in, and they told them they're going to play one of the biggest games of the year, and they told them they couldn't stay in the hotel. Mm. And the brothers refused to play mm. until they changed it. And they, they started looking at the money. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and they said, we better change. We better let them in the hotel. You know, I, think it was the, I think it was the Houston Oilers. I'm not sure, but, you know. But this is the legacy. This is the history. And if you're not connected to that history, you know, and again, you know, we talk about the gang culture thing. It was regional. You know that in your time growing up. Mm -hmm. that, wasn't a real, that wasn't a reality of your neighborhood, right. of your city. Right. It was laughable. Am I right or wrong? No, oh, correct. It was laughable to see guys, man, and, you know, lumberjacks plaid shirts and, you know, head rags and killing each other over colors. It was laughable. You, know, you growing up where, you know, you know, almost everybody around you, was, his name was either Hassan or Malik or Hafiz or Ibn. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. Right. And you're growing up and every, you know, everybody's name is, you know, Slick Dog and, you know, Old Yellow and, you know, Ice Cube and, I see these names are em emanate from pimp culture. Mm -hmm. Iceberg Slim was one of the most notorious pimps. Mm -hmm. Books were some of the most well known. So you take, you start taking the name, you see, you start grabbing bottom of the barrel in the culture, you know, you know, the N word culture, so to speak. And you start embracing that. You know. So on the East Coast, we called each other God. We say, peace, God. During that period, we were being influenced by the Nation of Islam, Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali, our five percenters, you know, and that became thing. our women were queens. And so it gets flipped a few decades later, and it's like you know, instead of God, it's like we reverse it and call each other dog. Yo, yeah, that's my dog, man. Mm -hmm. To this day, yeah, that's my, yeah, it was my dog, mm -hmm. my dog. 
and then you call, you know, the, the woman that you used to call your queen is now the bitch, your bitch. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's some young brothers who use the terminology. Yeah, if you ask them, what does that mean? You know the definition of that? And some of them couldn't even tell you. They know it's derogatory. They know they shouldn't be using it. But you know, that's, that's a female dog. Right. So you know, this is the dog day. Yeah, yeah. What are oh, wait, what are, dog, yeah, day, yeah. dog day afternoon, man? So I'm mm. very concerned about about that, man. And guys, I said, Free and Ricky Ross said, I wasn't even a gang member, but I would go to different cities and different states and get involved with crews and just supply them with the dope so that these gangs could now carry the drugs through city to city, state to state. So mm -hmm. he was promoting the whole drug world and his drug empire and using gang, what better distribution network than to give it to gang? Yeah. If if crack cocaine had never really, you know, developed in the black, not developed, that bomb, that crack bomb had never been dropped on the black community and the heroin bomb before that, these gangs might have stayed regional. They might have never, you know, uh become pervasive and traveled and because they didn't have the money. Mm. See, but but the money actually allowed the gang to grow, to be able to get into, uh, to back and start their own little record labels, Easy e you know, Death yeah. Row. These are all companies that came out of that particular culture. And interesting with the gangs, you know, obviously, things become commerce, things become a business, even in the gang life. I mean, you talk about drugs, this other stuff that they start taking upon themselves, which I think is just, you know, direct, you know, disgusting from like, you know, trafficking of kids and everything else too. So it, it, it became a business. Yeah, it became a business, all this stuff. Yeah. And who are we following, Ibn? That's nothing new. That's, yes. that's what white, Italian, Jewish gangsters did throughout our whole history. Mm -hmm. They did it to jazz musicians. They did it to blues musicians. They robbed them of their royalties. They robbed them of their publishing. So geniuses like Duke Ellington didn't die a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. you know, geniuses like, you know, uh, Little Richard, you know, who made a record, you know, and sold over a million copies and was paid $33. Yeah. You know. They call, you know, they call Ruth Brown, a great blues singer, you know, they call Atlantic Records, the house that Ruth built. So these major companies that we got so much respect for, you know, Capitol Records and Atlantic Records and Warner Brothers, much of this has been built on the facts of black people that were robbed and of course. Who blood yeah. and stuff and whose bones were grinding the powder and who died penniless. And, mm -hmm. and so now we continue, we come up and give a few dollars, and then we continue the same gangsterism and the same exploitation. And so we, you know, we give lip profession how much we love our artists. And then you find out that the same person who's saying that then robbed them for all this publishing. Hmm. Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, they had to leave the company hmm. they were with after they had made millions and hundreds of millions of dollars for their company. Because their 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 royalties and their publishing have been stolen, not by white gangsters, but by black. So then we we become our own oppressors by copying, you know, what our oppressors did to us, and we become the same the same enemy of our own people. That's what the dope game is about. I mean, you know. You know incredible scene from the godfather where all the mafia dons sit around and decide whether they're going to go into the drug game in the line from the book and then the movie but the book put it more succinctly it said well i believe that we should do it but we go into the heroin business but we keep it as a business and give it to the niggas the animals anyway let them lose their soul that wasn't just a movie <laughs> i saw that Mm -hmm. I saw that reality, not that movie. Before I saw the movie, I saw the reality of drugs being poured into. You saw the reality. 
or yes. germs being poured into our, dumped into our, our community and controlled and kept in our community. But sometimes neighboring neighborhoods and white communities we still become unscathed and untouched by, and our communities look like war zones. So that was systematic. And so now we jump into the dope game and we brag about and glorify the drug culture. And, and major drug dealers become heroes of the black community. You know, I remember the movie I'm um, Frank Lucas, American Gangster, which, you know, I always felt, you know, Denzel should never even have taken that role. You know, you know he should have done what, you know, Sidney Poitier, Cecily Tyson, and many other black artists. And I'm just saying, no, I refuse to take that role. <laughs> I refuse to play that. You know, even Paul Robeson refused to make the movie Othello. And that was a, mm -hmm. a more respected character that Shakespeare wrote about. But he said, I'm not going to make the movie. I'm not going to let you uh, 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 document me as this African who was um, deceived by his lowly servant, Iago, who wound up killing himself and his wife. That's, that's the story that Shakespeare wrote about Othello. Mm -hmm. Paul Robeson refused to do it and walked away from it. You know, these men had it. That's, that's what you call integrity. Courage. And um, so American Gangster, based on the life of Frank Lucas, notorious drug dealer who flooded his community with drugs at the behest of the white mafia. You know, but we call him as you know one of the songs. I think Jay Z made a, a album. The album, right? Called American Gangster. He calls him a, um, a ghetto superstar. Even in the, even in the, even in the. Uh, Gang. I mean, the criminal culture, he's a rat. So he's not even, he's like the lowest at the bottom of the rung in the criminal culture. <laughs> but you could be a rat and a criminal who actually oppresses and uh, uh, becomes an enemy of your own people, a traitor to your own people. But if you got the bag, you become a hero. That's sad, brother. Mm -hmm. Very sad when you think about it. You could be a rat. Not the criminal's bad enough, but you could be a rat. But we're in the year of the rat, so to speak, of, <laughs> where the rat is glorified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that's a whole switch. You know, again, you know, the world is upside down. Yeah, the Nigerian writer in Googie says the world is upside down. Where at mm -hmm. one time a rat's life would be, you know, in jeopardy for doing some of the things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But yeah. now be a hero. What's the guy's name? Sixty nine, whatever this guy's name. Is. Oh, six nine. Right. He's still making you know, boatloads of money, promoting and being promoted and looked up upon. And, you know. and so we're in a strange time. And so, yeah, I'm very concerned about what these kind of depictions, you know, called the Super Bowl. And it just goes to show how asleep we are, you know. You know, it's a slap in the face to someone. It's a slap in the face to, to Malcolm, Maya, Elijah, James Ball. It's a slap in the face to our ancestors, to Harry. You know, it's a slap in the face to our, to our ancestors. And we don't even see it as a slap in the face. We're talking about, you know, um, uh, an insurrection where you have a group of white folks that are basically trying to um, derail the election of the president of the United States and and um, and uh, derail democracy, undermine the very constitution in this country, and threatening to kill a vice president and. Um, so the the very the very uh, fact of democracy, whether this country is going to be a democracy, is in is in peril. That's how close we you know, we came to you know uh, <clears throat> an overthrow, a coup. You know? mm -hmm. so, uh, and we're talking about that's that's a slap in the face that you have a Supreme Court justice a Negro by the name of Clarence Thomas, whose wife they have now found out 
has issued numerous, sent numerous messages through email and texting to other politicians throughout the country, high elected officials to make sure we take our country back. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but make sure that we you know, don't let uh, the Supreme Court you know, investigate Donald Trump in, you know, and, uh, and trying to undermine the system of justice with a Supreme Court justice who happens to be our husband. Mm -hmm. Right. Gina, yeah. Gina Thomas. But instead of talking about Gina Thomas, that's like sedition. That's like treason. But instead of talking about Gina Thomas and that slap in the face to all of us, we're talking about um, Chris Rock and Will Smith. That slap in the face. I just sat back, man, and watched on every day there was more media attention and just in your circle of people, everybody's talking about it. And then mm -hmm. two days that everybody's still talking. A week passed and they're still talking about it. A month passed and they're still talking about it. Months have passed and we're still talking about it. the slap in the face. Mm -hmm. They're being slapped in the face back and forth. Yes. yes. They just passed, as you said, you know, the Anti-Lynching Act in 2022. Crazy. That's a slap in the face, man. You finally mm -hmm. get around to passing a bill that says you shouldn't lynch black folks. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is this is how sleep we are. Just, you know, we're not even focusing on these things. Because mm -hmm. you know, we're so caught up into into popular culture. You know, celebrities have become our gods. In this country, you know, celebrity love. And that's another thing Elijah Muhammad said in his great book, The Message of the Black Man. He said, sport and play are the gods of this world. So after a celebrity reaches a certain pinnacle of success and fame, he's no longer just a human. He can't die. Michael Jackson is still alive, according to him. Mm -hmm. Elvis Presley is not dead. There's some people your age and right that will argue that Tupac is still alive. Mm -hmm. Because we won't, we can't let them die because they're our gods. Right, right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever you worship becomes your god. And so, you know, there's a great book called Celebrity Culture by David Halberstam. And he talks about how in America, celebrities become gods. <laughs> and so, yeah, we're, uh, we're in a serious time. This is the decay, decline of the American empire as a world power, as the world power. We know law, everybody kind of can see. America's not the world power anymore. You know, mm -hmm. the, the policemen of the world. Other people have the nuclear weapon. Right, right. <laughs> and ready yeah. to use it. Everybody's saying, you know, so, okay, what? What? So we're living in the decline of the empire. But at the same time, the decay of African American culture. And that's it. That's why I thought it's important. Maya, a voice like Maya, a mind like Maya Angelou, whose uh, brilliance and her soul touched across intergenerational lines. You know, Maya was beloved and listened to, and by people in our are uh, octogenarians, 70, 80 years old, and yet Maya could reach somebody like Tupac in common, you know, and Dave Chappelle. This is how wide ranging and broad her wisdom is. And we have to, we have to really go back and revere and lift her up and listen to her because she's more than just a poet. You know, our um, mainstream America tries to frame her as a poet. And that's why I was talking to you about, it's important that we, recognize who and what we are. Right. I'm, I'm a filmmaker. You know, even though I've done a lot of things in my life, you know, and um, but I'm a writer, a filmmaker, an artist, an actor. Maya is more than just a poet. Maya is actually a, a, a philosopher, as well as a writer, author, actress. She's a philosopher. Mm -hmm. A modern day philosopher. Maya, as much as we quote, you know, Shakespeare or Aristotle, because she's one of, one of our great philosophers. That's right. And um, the sexism 
in philosophy as well as life and life in general does not respect women and put women in that role and see women as a philosopher. You talk about the great philosophers of the world, and it's no coincidence that they're men. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Emerson, Thoreau. But listen to Maya. Listen to Maya's you know, profound quotes that she makes. When somebody shows you who they are, believe them. Believe them. The first time. <laughs> That's a lot. It's philosophy. These are words to live by. You know, you know these are these are uh, proverbs and, and sayings that we can, you know, that are as useful as a, a list of things to do. We can live by these things. And do you know that my again, the way you're framed and the way your narrative is, and, and if it's not correct, you uh, you're painted in the wrong light. When we show this film. We usually ask people, many times when people are very moved at seeing the film, that's the mantra of our company, we make movies that move people. <clears throat> and Maya is certainly a moving, heartwarming figure. And when we show the film, people ask in the Q&As afterwards, um, well, I ask the audience, after they ask some questions of their own, I ask them, can anybody tell me what school Maya graduated from? And different people hold up their hands. And, and they, do you know, Anthony? Mm, no, the college, college you're talking about? Yeah. yeah what university? Off oh, mm -hmm. the limb, I, I'm going to say no. I don't want to take an educated guess and say Spelman or something like that or Clark. But... Good, good. Because when you don't know, you yeah. don't know. Right. <laughs> that's, right. that's another one of the philosophical sayings. When you know mm -hmm. better, you do better. Do better. Yes. When you don't know, you do the best you can. But when you know better, you do better. Yes. And so when I asked that question, the same thing response that I just got, people's minds go blank and you can start seeing pages of colleges flipping in their face. Right, right. And, uh, and then people hold up their hands and you hear, you know, the Ivy League universities, Harvard, you know, Yale, you know, Princeton. And uh, then you hear the historically black universities from the bourgeois segment of the audience. Uh, Howard, you know, mm -hmm. you know, Morehouse, Hampton, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. Feldman. Right. And, and then I tell the people that Maya Angelou didn't graduate from any of these universities. She never graduated from the university. She received numerous doctors, you know, the right, right, right. all kinds of universities because many universities went through her mm -hmm. but she did she is not the product of a university she's a product of the universe mm -hmm. so none of these american universities are european can or you know, middle east they can't claim her that's right so the the, the giants the, the incredible giants among us the elijah muhammad's the Malcolms, the Muhammad Ali's, the James Baldwin, same thing. Many universities came through James Baldwin, one of the most brilliant intellects of uh, the last century. But James Baldwin didn't graduate from any of these universities. He's not a product of the university, he's a product of the universe. Hmm. John Henry Clark. So we have to start, like you say, saying, hmm. There's something about that knowledge that these men and women went beyond the university. Not that they had disdain for, for education, for formal, you know, but they didn't just stay in that box and they read voraciously everything they could put their hands on and mm -hmm. they opened up their mind. And like you asked me, they had this voracious appetite for knowledge, for truth, for wisdom. Because, again, you know, to, for my answer, that was wealth. That was the bag at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The brother or sister who had the knowledge, that was the bag. <laughs> you know? Yes. That, that was the wealth. Mm -hmm. That's what enriches you. 
not what you have, but what you know. And um, and so yeah, so that, that was why it was so important for uh, for us to do this piece called "My Angela: Reflections of a Blessed Soul." And, uh, it's a beautiful piece. Um, there's a, uh, a film poster that we use where you see Maya dancing with uh, the great poet, playwright, and writer, uh, and activist and revolutionary, Amiri Baraka, mm. who I was blessed to know well. And, uh, actually went to school with my mother and um, lived in Newark all his life. And his son now is the mayor of Newark, Baz Baraka. But um, there's a picture that we use in our movie poster uh, for this film, and it shows Maya Angelou and um, Amir Baraka dancing together. And um, they're at the Schomburg. They're at the Schomburg Museum. And um, uh, they're celebrating the life of Langston Hughes, who was another one of Maya Angelou's contemporaries. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine sitting around? The whole circle, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I could show it. I have a poster. Will it show up? Oh, absolutely. You might be able to see. Hmm. There, you, there you see Maya Angelou. Yes. And Amir Baraka dancing at the Schomburg over the remains. Because the remains have been placed in the Schomburg Museum. And in the foreground, you see Amina. Baraka, who's Amir Baraka's wife. That's a classic, iconic um, photograph. Mm. And um, when we were doing research to do this film, you know, I found that photograph and said, we got to use that. Mm -hmm. And I knew how close my and Amir were. But dancing over the remains of Langston Hughes brought all three of these great, brilliant, creative minds together. Not entertainment. You, know, like you don't put Langston in. <laughs> Langston is an artist. Yes. There's a difference. <laughs> you know, you know, but for the artist, he has a commitment to elevate, inspire, and encourage, and use his art as a weapon. Not a weapon to destroy, you know, but a weapon to restore. Like Shakespeare said, art is food for the soul. So once I uh researched uh, where this picture came from, I found out that it was taken by one of um, our great photographers by the name of Chester Higgins. And um, then you start thinking about, as a, as a writer, a filmmaker, creative person, you start thinking about wow, what went into the details, because it's not a selfie. You know, that mm -hmm. all, that's another thing, of, you know, this, I call this the selfie generation. You know, and most pictures you see of that era of these great people were not selfies. Where you, you, you get pictures of them in motion or you know in just um, uh, talking or standing or doing the, doing the work or you know. But we we live in a time now where everybody's got their head buried in their phone. Oh yeah, people can't even look at each other. You used to could meet somebody walking down the street. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know there's people that are married today, man, that that's the way that they met, that their eyes met. They looked across the room, you know, or in a school, you know, you might have met your childhood sweetheart that way. You're walking down the street, you're in a car, somebody comes along the sidewalk and you see them and your eyes meet and something takes place, you know, the eyes of the arrows of the soul, they say, you know, and so you connect. And there's many people who are married and who went on, you know, to have long relationships and children and, 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 and found love. Yes. Because they connected that way by looking at each other. I mean, we don't even look at each other that way. And now how many great, Romances and relationships are being missed 
because we're walking down the street now like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> I mean, right. You may, right. Miss the, you may miss the love of your life, man. Yeah. And yeah. so I, when I started thinking about the details of that picture being taken, I said, wow. Versus a, it's an incredible photograph because the photographer caught them in action. They weren't looking at the photographer. They were looking at each other. Mm -hmm. They were involved in the dance. They were thinking about Langston. And do you know that picture later on became the front page of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And as I did my research and thinking about the details of the picture, where it was taken, when it was taken, who took it, I found out that the photographer was still alive. And his name was Chester Higgins. And Chester Higgins is on that level of Gordon Parks, one of the great, uh, James Van Der Zee, one of the great photographers of our time um, in the last century. So I um, was an author also, traveled all over the world, has an incredible works of art and exhibitions that he's done. Um, so I found him, from, you know, I started doing my research. As a filmmaker, you have to be sort of a detective also. Yes. You know, you start searching and reaching and calling and, and reading and you know, tracking people down. So I found out he was still alive and he lived in a beautiful brownstone in Brooklyn. And I contacted him, told him what we were doing about the Maya Angelou film. And he said, sure. And he agreed to have me interview. I said, I'd like to interview you about, you know, that photograph, that day, and that particular iconic photograph that, that you took. And he corrected me. He said, I don't, I don't take photographs. He said, I make photographs. Mm. And he said, when I saw Maya and Amiri dancing over the remains of Langston Hughes at the Schaumburg, which is one of the most, you know, uh, one of the greatest depositories of archival material for African Americans and Africans in the country, he said, I just knew it was a, a special moment. The confluence of these spirits, these ancestral spirits dancing. Yes. Yes. And I just stood back and went into a corner and went to like a Zen type moment. And I just took it and I captured it. And he said, I read, he was working for the New York Times at the time. And he said, I rushed down to, uh, to the office and in order for it to get in in time to be printed and put in the paper the next day. Mm. Yeah, the next day, the New York Times had a, uh, uh, a little article written saying that, uh, Amiri and Maya Angelou, two great artists, you know, uh, doing African dances over the remains of Langston Hughes. And when we interviewed Maya, she laughed and she said, I don't know what they were talking about. I was doing the jitterbug. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Amiri said he was doing the Texas hop, you know. But uh, again, this is how people think they know us and how they think they'll frame you, you know. And, um, uh, but they were best of friends, comrades, and warrior activists together. And uh, some of my greatest inspirations. And I'm, I'm honored to have known both of them. You know, mm -hmm. had the chance not only to know them, you know, like to have met them, but to have been collaborated with. Them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Including them in some of my creative work. You know? So uh. that's an honor. Speaking of honors, I want to ask for one last thing. Yeah, as far as when it's all said and done, when they when they say Hafiz Fari, what do you want people to say? Well, brother, um, what touches my heart more than anything is when young brothers like you and I've experienced this many times and no matter how many times I experience it, it, uh, it humbles me. Um, when young brothers say to me, you were like the father to me. You were one of my mentors. Brother, you may not know it, but uh, you helped save my life. Hmm. More than anything, that's the legacy that I'm most proud of, and I've mm -hmm. touched somebody's life. Mm -hmm. you know, 
because in my own life, after all the things that I had done, things that I had committed that I'm not proud of, mm -hmm. mistakes that I've made, um, I made a vow to myself at some point, especially after my own sons were born, that I would uh, correct the mistakes um, and that I would grow up and I would never be an older, older brother that young people could say, oh man, he, he another one of them old cats, man, he ain't never really shared no, he ain't shared no wisdom, he ain't passed nothing down. He, I made a vow to myself, I would never be one of those people. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the legacy, man. If I touch somebody's life, how many lives that you've touched, man, that's a greater legacy than any awards that you won, any amount of money, the fame, famous people that you've met, the travel, you know, what you wear, what you accomplish. You know, that's that's the leg that's what I like doing. People still work. Right, I think that that vow you made with yourself, you you stood on it. And you know, I'm a testament to that, you know. Um and I've shared this with you even off the of, off of this as well too. You know, it's been extension of my father. I mean, obviously my father as well in my life to this day and everything else here, but you know, I think just me having extensions of him, whether, right. Such as yourself and others here. And, and, and again, I just wanted to say, you know, just, just thank you. Just throughout all these years here, you know, I know I joked before, you know, whether it's week, wake, bringing rock him there, taking us to hang out, but even the car rides and the bus trips to Florida, I mean, <laughs> all this stuff here, like you was always a presence in my life here, and, you know, and, and to this day here, like, you know, uh, to a point that I, I get speechless and I'm surprised I'm even able to share this. And I just, just wanted to just say, just thank you, you know, for just being in my life and continuing to be in my life here. Like I said, I'm- Praise be to God, praise be to God. And just, and just continue doing what you're doing and passing it down. Remember my Angelo statement, she learned mm -hmm. from my grandmother. If you learn it, if, if someone teaches you something, share it. If you have it, share it. If you know it, teach it. Mm -hmm. And so continue doing what you're doing because that's what, that's what led me and inspired me. I yes. met people who, like you say, who didn't have to. But the right. reality is that we do have to. The reality is that we do have an obligation. That, mm -hmm. that really is every generation, France Fanon said, has a generation to go back and teach that uh, upcoming generation and share with them and fulfill that responsibility to either fulfill it or betray it. Mm -hmm. And I was aware of that, that if you don't do that, you're betraying your responsibility. To mm. yeah. every, every generation has that responsibility. So, yes. so we say praise be to God. Yes. Uh, thank you, and again, thank you once thank again you. for this time. And um, inshallah, one way or another, I'll definitely be in touch. Okay. All right. Peace, my brother. Peace. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, I just get a little speech just sometimes, you know, while I'm doing these. And again, it just goes back to that since why I even started doing this, you know, while I'm just having the opportunity just to hear, you know, uh, people's walks, you know, sharing information and what have you, et cetera, et cetera, here. You know, Hafiz is just one of those people, 40 plus, knocking on 50 here, been around pretty much for all of it. You know, so, um, no, thank you, thank you. That being said, I'm just gonna step away. I put my hand over my heart. That means I feel you. Yeah. <laughs>